So last time we talked about torsional deformation. Um, now we're going to talk about the stress that that creates on, um, on our material. So we know torsional strain varies linearly with the radius. And that's what we figured out last time. So for a linear elastic material, when we looked at a stress strain diagram, in the elastic region, um, we talked about the modulus of elasticity uh, being uh, E. Uh, that is the slope, um, that constant slope uh, of the stress strain diagram. Um, and that gives us our relationship between strain and stress, right? We can talk about the same thing with shear, but we call it the shear modulus of elasticity shear modulus of elasticity, and that is signified by G here. So all of the stress strain diagrams that we looked at, we were really looking at normal uh, stress and strain. Um, we can make a similar kind of diagram like this down here that has to do with shear stress. Uh, and we have a similar elastic region, and so we can define a G. So it, G tells us if I put a certain amount of stress on um, an object, twisting stress, uh, how much deformation am I going to get, right? If I have a high G, if, I'm if I have a stiff material uh, or a, a material that is stiff in a shear direction, uh, then I can apply a really large stress and not get much deformation. A low G would imply, uh, uh, of course, that if I applied that stress, I would get a great big deformation, okay? And so we can write this here, right? This is equivalent to this equation. And this tells us that the shear uh, strain is going to be that stress divided by G. Okay, so a big G means my strain will be relatively small. So let's take that equation here. We know that one and we know that one because we're going to combine those two on the next slide. All right, so we put these two equations together. Uh, we start here with our shear strain. Um, we add in our relationship between shear strain and shear stress, uh, and we end up with an expression for shear stress. And not surprisingly, given that shear strain and shear stress uh, vary linearly uh, in the elastic region, we discover that um, stress, shear stress, also varies with the radius um, when we have a torsional moment here, when we have a twisting uh, torque. Now we're going to, we want to be able to talk about, well, what if I apply a certain torque um, or a moment to a, a member like this? Uh, what does that do in terms of my stress? And so we're going to bring torque into our equation. If we think about torque is uh, force crossed with the radius. Um, radius and torque here are always going to be perpendicular. Okay, and so the, the torque at any given, let's say the torque of this area is going to be my rho uh, crossed with my force, right? My shear stress here times the size of that area, right? That would be the force. Um, then what we can do is say, okay, that, the torque on that area is this term here, right? My shear stress, which is in force per unit area times the area. So this is my force crossed with my radius, right? Which is my lever arm here. And we're going to integrate that for all of the area here to find the total torque on our cross section. In other words, we're finding the internal resultant torque here. Um, if I take that expression for my shear stress here and replace it with this, then I can do this, and I've got this equation now. And I'm going to pull out my constant. So I know this has a given T max here. Uh, C is just the radius of my uh, circular member here. And now we have uh, an integral of the radius. 
Now that might look a little bit familiar, right? That looks like a moment. Uh, it's a, or a moment of area, right? A QR squared here. Uh, and in fact, that's what it is. Um, that integral of rho squared is what's called the polar moment of inertia. And it's basically um, summing up uh, how far away that area is from the center of the axis. And that matters here because the stress is so much bigger on the outside uh, than it is on the inside. And so this is giving a big weight to the area that's towards the edge of the cylinder. The J there, then, this term is our second moment of area. It's the polar moment of inertia around our axis uh, and allows us to simplify our equation here. And this now tells us, okay, if I know how much torque I'm applying, I know the radius of my, um, of, my, uh, of my circular member, and I know the polar moment of inertia of my circular member, I can tell you what my maximum stress is. And that's what we want. That's going to be important uh, for design terms. Here's another version of that if we wanted to know the torque or, or the shear stress rather uh, at a particular point within our circle like if we wanted to find it out what it was here at this radius uh, this equation would tell us that this gives us our maximum stress if we want to know what the maximum stress is now to J we talked a little bit about this in our little mini lectures on moments but let's go ahead and see how we find that, just as a, as a kind of example here. And what we're going to do is we have to do a little bit of, of, of calculus uh, and integrate um, over the, the entire cross section by turning it into a bunch of little annular sections. And so we can say that this little ring here is d rho thick, okay, um, and it's going to have a circumference of 2 pi rho, right? So this is the area of each of those circles. So that's replacing our dA, okay? So we're instead of adding up little squares of area, we're adding up little rings of area. And then we're going to solve that for rho squared, okay, because this is our second moment of area, we pull out our constants and we've got the integration of rho to the third um, from zero to c, in other words, from the center out to the edge of the circle. If we integrate this, a relatively straightforward integration, we're going to get uh, a rho to the fourth term uh, and then if we go from c to zero, we end up with this guy here, pi over two, uh, c to the fourth. And that tells us what the moment of, second moment of area of um, this circle is, or any circle, really, okay? So it's just a function of c, of what that radius is. Now, if we wanted to do a tubular shaft, if we didn't have uh, a fully solid circle, but instead had, a, say, a tube that had metal on the outside but was empty in the center, uh, we could do a similar kind of integration and we'd end up with this guy here. But J is determined only by uh, geometry. It is a, um, a second moment of area, and so it's going to be just a matter of uh, what the shape is. And that's all for today. So a little, a little calculus, just to you know, keep you on the, the edge of your seat. <laughs>